sellers. There's different, yeah. there's, there's a lot of scenarios that sellers can get themselves into when buying and selling congruently. We've mm-hmm. discussed this in the past, but there's also certain language that should be on the purchase and sales agreement to protect these sellers. And specifically, that's pretty much what I wanted to pick your brain about today. Absolutely, Emilio. There are so many um, moving pieces and so many layers of the transactions that we're seeing right now. And at least for now, we're still mostly in a seller's market. I know there's starting to be some conversations about a shifting market and you know, there's some more inventory coming on, but this is what always happens in the fourth quarter routinely anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, we see less buyers and more inventory typically. So I think right now we're still holding fast that it's a seller's market. And as a result, there's really no reason that a seller should not be protected if they have a need to find another house to purchase, or if they've already found another house, incorporate some sort of language that ties the two transactions together such that in the event, God forbid, their simultaneous purchase falls through, then in that case, the house that they have to sell can be delayed accordingly because we never want to see the seller effectively homeless. Mm. Either that, or we need to be having a conversation with those seller clients about their contingency plans. So the primary language that we would like to include, assuming that they're already under contract to purchase their new house, let's just say that they were in a financial position where they didn't have to sell their current home, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we want some language that says this sale, one, two, three main street is contingent on the seller simultaneously purchasing their replacement property at, you know, 405 North way or whatever the addresses are uh, expected closing to take place on or before such and such a date in the event. And, you know, these are all the different languages that can be developed in the event of a delay of said closing, then sellers have the ability to extend this particular matter, one, two, three main street for X number of days, weeks, months, whatever. These are all negotiations. And it's, it's really important that I think all parties recognize that this is not one size fits all, because as you can see, probably just in this very brief onset of a dialogue that we're having, we really need to make sure we're developing the facts for each individual buyer and seller to make sure that we're adequately satisfying what the parties intend, what is that manifestation? And now how can we get it down in writing with these provisions? You really do have to be very careful in crafting this language, because as I always say, you're the architect of this deal. You know what Mm -hmm. the buyers and the sellers intend, and it's now your responsibility to make sure that you're properly reducing this to writing, which sort of dances on the line of the unauthorized practice of law, because now as non-lawyers, you're creating contractual provisions. Normally, the MLS forms, you're just sort of, you know, clicking through and filling in the blanks with things that you've been trained to do. But drafting language for a precise agreement that your parties just contemplated that you've never been down that road before, don't do it alone. Get your broker involved, get your seasoned fellow, you know, colleagues involved, get the attorneys involved for the respective buyers and sellers, because that's going to be your best protection as an agent and probably the best protection for the client, which is ultimately going to be what you want to do. 